You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. Hope of the resurrection. It's a wonderful subject, uh, a wonderful hope. But I want to start off by just maybe considering why we're looking at this subject in the first place. Uh, and the reason is, is it needs to be affirmed that the resurrection is the true hope that the Bible teaches. If we ask a lot of people out in the street or, you know, many people, most Christians, for example, what happens when we die? Many of them will say, well, the life, the body has a soul. Uh, and after death, then the soul goes one way uh, and the body goes the other. Uh, if you've been good, uh, your soul might uh, be in, a, uh, in hell, in eternal torment. Uh, sorry, the other way around, in heaven, eternal bliss, it, or, or if you've been bad, the soul might go to hell or in eternal torment. Um, this is not actually what the Bible teaches. Now, I should add on the bottom there, uh, some groups say, well, actually, we're going to have the best of both worlds, and actually, we're going to have a rapture as well, um, and then the physical body is going to be reunited with the soul, uh, but in the meantime, you'll be in, uh, you'll be in heaven, for example. We are going to suggest this morning, that is not what the Bible teaches, in fact, more than suggest, it is not what the Bible teaches, my friends. We're going to see why. To do so, we're going to have a quick look very, very at, at the beginning um, at where this idea may have come from. Uh, and I think this is really, really important because belief in the immortality of the soul um, was an important aspect in Greek philosophy. Uh, we've got a quote there where, uh, from Plato where it says, is, not the separation of soul, uh, is it not the separation of soul and body? To be dead is the completion of this uh, when the soul exists in herself and is released from the body and body is released from the soul. What is this but death? So we're starting to get the idea, aren't we, that these things uh, have their roots in Greek philosophy. Of course, the Greeks were known for uh, their much thinking. Uh, for some reason, that's not clicking on. There we go. Socrates, again, another uh, eminent Greek philosopher, he explained that the immortal soul, once free from the body, is re rewarded according to good deeds or punished for evil. Uh, all of these uh, Greeks, let's not forget, um, are sometime around uh, BC 3 to 500 or so. Uh, so way before the Lord Jesus Christ came on the scene and uh, so-called Christianity, as I put it in inverted commas there, uh, uh, came along. So all of these things were, were steeped in, in the minds of, of people of the time. Plato, uh, again, uh, saw, it says there, saw man's existence as divided into the material and spiritual uh, and talked about things like transmigration of the soul. So without going into too much detail, I want us just to be able to see that the concept of the immortal soul began in ancient Greek philosophy. So having said that then, how did this come to be adopted into early Orthodox Christian dogma? And how has it come to be adopted into many of the churches today? Well, one thing we have to understand, uh, my friends, is the early Christian church is not the same thing as the first century believers and what they believed. What we understand through history and through scripture is that the early Christian church, as it were, were led and influenced by the church fathers, eminent theologians uh, from, uh, you know, around the time of the apostles through to the time uh, of uh, Catholicism. I put Roman Catholicism there. I probably shouldn't have done, probably actually was called officially Roman Catholicism a bit later on at the Great Schism. Uh, but the foundation of, uh, of dogma in the Nicene Creed in uh, AD 325. Now they held doctrines which are false. They're opposed to scriptural teaching, as we'll see in a few moments' time, concerning the resurrection and concerning other things as well. And the Catholic Church teaches that its public ministry began on Pentecost, uh, which is interesting, of course, because that's the very true biblical account of when the apostles uh, were teaching. And it also teaches that uh, the College of Bishops, uh, led by the Bishop of Rome, are successors of the apostles. So we understand, don't we, that, uh, of course, uh, the Catholic Church is going to uh, identify itself with uh, the roots of true Christianity. But what I'm going to tell you is that actually uh, what they believe is, is false. Uh, they do not believe the same things as the first century believers. Uh, the ecclesias formed and ministered to by the apostles we read about in the Bible, those found in our New Testament scriptures, whose basis of fellowship is the Apostles' Creed uh, and were true Christians. So it's an important point for us to, to consider um, of course, many of us are aware of that already, but if you're not, that's very important for us to consider. And it's around that time that uh, the true biblical teaching of the apostles was corrupted. And one such corruption was the uh, doctrine of the immortality of the soul. 
So if we were to look at a couple of the church fathers, just to kind of cement this into our minds, uh, we can see one of them was uh, Oregon. Um, he was an admirer of Plato. Uh, and as such, we believe he was influenced uh, by uh, some of the things which Plato had to say regarding the immortality of the soul. Uh, and such that he wrote the soul having a substance and it of its own uh, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, again, Augustine, uh, a bit later on, the soul is therefore called immortal because in a sense it does not cease to live and to feel. So I think what we can see is that these early church fathers, so-called, um, have been influenced uh, by Greek philosophy. Uh, and that has then been uh, incorporated into church doctrine. Um, so just to give you a visual uh, idea of what we're talking about, uh, one Bible, many churches, that's a, a subject that you might hear here on a, uh, another Sunday morning. Uh, but just to give you an idea, you can see there, uh, this is a historian's uh, idea of, of, of how it works. And you've got um, obviously around about um, Christ on the left hand side. Uh, then it's it's not actually to scale, but you get the idea. AD 33, it says the Pentecost, AD 325, the first ecumenical council uh, with the Nicene Creed, um, AD 1054, the great schism of East and West. Uh, and of course, from those offshoots there, you have uh, various other uh, reformations, um, and that's how the, the Protestant church came to be. So what I would suggest to you then is that actually what we have, this is Joe's version of this uh, of this um, uh, image, is that we've got first century believers um, who believed the truth all around that time. And actually that truth has carried on with a very, very faint line, but it is not along the same line as what we see in that Catholic apostolic church. In fact, it's running alongside that line. It's different. It's a line of truth, and it's different to what we see in the other churches. And we still have that truth today, brothers and sisters and friends. Uh, we have Christians believing in biblical truth, uh, and we can see that false doctrine uh, came in and corrupted truth around about that time. And that's how uh, not just the Catholic Apost Apostolic Church, or the Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the uh, Russian Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, and the Protestant churches and all of their daughters, as the Bible describes them, have all been influenced in some way uh, by false doctrine. It's a really important point for us to understand. Uh, and to go into this in uh, great detail, um, we'd have to go uh, have, a, have a whole other uh, subject, but I think it's important for us to look at, because this emphasizes to us uh, the uniqueness of Bible truth and how special it is. It's a pearl of great price, the Bible says. And it's something which I think we really need to think about and understand that actually what we have is something very special. So some people will say, oh, well, the Christadelphians are just another offshoot of, uh, you know, the Protestant church. Uh, and therefore, they, too, have, have been influenced uh, by those teachings. But actually, I suggest to you that's not the case. I'll put Christadelphians down there because we believe, brothers and sisters and friends, that everything that we do believe can be uh, taken straight from the Bible. We want to model ourselves on those first century believers and that first century ecclesia. And the ecclesia, as we know, if you like, can be described as, uh, uh, as one, even though they might be in lots of different places. So in that sense, then, Bible truth has always been the same. And that's what we're aiming for. So just to kind of give ourselves an idea, then, uh, the origins of uh, the belief in the immortal soul replaced resurrection. And that's why we've been looking at it for the first half of our talk. Uh, we uh, we can see there that um, a quote from uh, J.N. Darby uh, at the bottom there, the uh, doctrine of the immortality of the soul came in to replace that of the resurrection. Um, but we also see here uh, in, in a quote from the Archbishop, Archbishop of Canterbury and York, uh, that the idea of inherent indestructibility of the human soul owes its origin to Greek, not to Bible sources. Of course, this is just one man's um, idea, but it supports what we've been saying. Uh, the central theme of the New Testament is eternal life not for anybody and everybody, but for believers in Christ as risen from the dead. So how life and death came into the world, what the Bible says. Why do we want to look at that? Well, to understand what the Bible says about the resurrection, we first have to just get a little understanding of uh, what the Bible says um, about life and death. We're not going to cover this in any great detail. Um, so just going to take a couple of very brief slides. We know, don't we, from the account in Genesis, what we'll all be familiar with, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Ah, soul, many people will say. There we go. That's that, you know, part which is, is living in its own ethereal way, uh, and then the body, which is also something else. Uh, but actually, that's, that's not the way the Hebrew describes it. 
we see that the same word is used, uh, and I put the word down at the bottom, uh, nifesh, um, to describe the creatures that were formed in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 19. So we understand, don't we, through the way that this word is used and the way it's translated in other places, creature, body, soul, life and person, but actually this is just a state of being. It's a state of existence rather than any ethereal uh, thing. And the Lord God commanded uh, the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. So we know that when we're back in the garden of Eden, we, we know the story, don't we? How that God said to, to the man, you, you're not going to eat of this. You can eat of any other tree of the, uh, of the garden, whatever you like, but you can't have this fruit. It was a command given and it was a command broken. And the Lord God said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And this is really where we understand that death came in, isn't it? We know that uh, in the margin, if you were to look at it in your Bible for uh, thou shalt surely die, it actually means dying, thou shalt die. You will become dying, you'll become mortal. You're not going to die uh, with a, a sudden and violent death, uh, but you will become dying. And the curse that is given in verse 19 of chapter 3, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. There's going to be, following the death of this being, this existent being, Adam, the man that was taken from the dust, who God breathed into his nostrils, is going to return to the dust. Man became mortal then because of sin, we see. But why do we die then? You might say, well, we're not Adam. Uh, why, why is it right that we die? Well, just a couple of verses that kind of give us an insight into what's going on here uh, are in Ezekiel. And we see there that actually the result of sin is death for all. Because it says here, behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the father, so also the soul of the son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And again, in verse 20 of chapter 18, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. You might say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a good person. But actually, the Bible teaches us, and again, a subject for another day, that actually all have fallen short, all sin. We're born into sin, if you like, born into that mortal dying nature, and then we commit sin. So it tells us here, uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, in Romans chapter 3, verses 23. Uh, and in Romans 5, verse 12, again, emphasizing what we've just said, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So God is just in, in, in his condemnation of, of the human race, because actually, not only did Adam sin, but we all sin. What is the death state then? So some people will say, well, actually, uh, what happens is uh, the soul departs from the body, uh, the body uh, you know, returns to the dust, but actually, uh, there isn't this um, kind of resurrection. Some will say it's just you go to heaven when you die. Uh, but actually, that's not what the Bible teaches, because the Bible says not only is uh, that teaching on the soul, the immortal soul, incorrect. It also says, well, actually, there is no thought. There is no uh, consciousness in the grave where we go, because it tells us, doesn't it, in Ecclesiastes, well-known words to many of us, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also, their love and their hatred, and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. It, it teaches us, actually, this existence ceases. This soul, if you like, or creature, ceases to exist. There is no thought. There isn't any part which lives on. Uh, again, in Ecclesiastes, uh, verses 9 and 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. There is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. It, it's not as if there is some kind of uh, other existence, other life, which is happening in the meantime or otherwise. The Bible says that's the end. That's it, at least for that period of time, as we will see, because obviously this talk is on the resurrection. So what have we seen so far? Well, the doctrine of the immortal soul replaced true Bible teaching about resurrection. Uh, the doctrine of the immortal soul, we believe, has its roots firmly in Greek philosophy. Now, the biblical definition of a living soul is simply a being or creature, such as mankind or the animals. And the sentence of death was brought upon Adam and his descendants due to his sin. And God is just in his sentence to Adam and to all his descendants, as all have sinned. The death state experienced by mankind is a cessation of all being, thought, consciousness, mind and body. So what is our hope then? Well, as we alluded to just a moment ago, it is the hope of the resurrection. So what of the resurrection then? What does the Bible have to say? Well, let's have a look in the Old Testament. We can see there... Uh, in Genesis chapter 17, 
uh, in the promises to Abraham, something quite special. In fact, one of my favorite uh, proofs of uh, the doctrine of, uh, of the resurrection, the true Bible teaching. And, and it says there, uh, God says to Abraham, neither shall thy name be any more called Abraham. Thy name shall be called Abraham. As a father of many nations have I made thee. Uh, and these are very important promises. I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, says God, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. So what we're trying to say now then is God has made this promise to Abraham. He's told him that he is going to be given this land it's, it's given to him and his seed. But is, has that ever happened? Can we be sure that this is talking of the resurrection? Well, yes, we can be completely sure that this is talking to the resurrection about the resurrection, because we're told so uh, in Acts chapter seven. We see in that speech there how that the, uh, it, it tells us that talking of uh, Abraham, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said unto him, get out of thy country and so on and so forth. And he took him to the promised land. But it tells us specifically, doesn't it, in this chapter in Acts, that God gave him none inheritance in it. No, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. So what we're trying to say is the only way for God to keep his promise is to raise Abraham from the dead. Otherwise, God is a liar. What about the faithful of all ages? Well, if we were to turn to Hebrews 11, I've got the passage up there. Feel free to turn up if you want to. It tells us there, all these faithful, these ones which if we were to say, oh, there is, there is going to be people that go to heaven, if that was the case, there would be these. That the Bible gives us as a chapter of many examples of people who are the most faithful, of, if you like. Of course, we know that the divine inspired word is, is giving us certain examples for a reason. But you see the point I'm trying to make. If we were to be able to say with any certainty, oh, these people would be in a heaven if, a, if it was heaven that we went to after death. It would be them. What does it tell us about them? All these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. That's odd. Why? Well, God provided something better for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. You see, the point is, there's going to be a resurrection. They didn't receive the promise because their reward is to come. It is life in God's kingdom to come. So that's a really uh, interesting thing for us to think about. Job also talks to us of the resurrection. We see there that he says, and though after my skin, worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. We know that Job was a man who uh, went through terrible trials in his life. Uh, at some point he wanted to die. But he says, I know that my redeemer lives, that he will stand on the latter day upon the earth. And it's at that point he realizes, of course, Job's been uh, dead for many, many uh, hundreds and thousands of years, that what was his body, which the worms destroy, that flesh will be what he uh, is, <laughs> is his body when he shall see God. That's what Job says. Whom I shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. What about the promises to David then? Well, we see, don't we, in 2 Samuel, Samuel 7, uh, and when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, this is God talking to David, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before them. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. This is really interesting, because it talks to us of the resurrection. We'll see a little bit later how we, we know that it must talk of the resurrection, because it's quoted in the New Testament. Uh, but we see here... That God tells David when his days be fulfilled and when he sleeps with his fathers. This is a time when David is dead. I will set up my seed after thee. Now we know that David's son Solomon was king while he was still alive. Uh, uh, so it must be talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, David's greatest son. And it says there, thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever. So this is a, an everlasting uh, house and kingdom. One that we expect uh, from the kingdom of God on earth before thee. Well, how is that possible? The only way that's possible is if David is raised from the dead. Paul, in his defense, again, talks of the promises made to the fathers. He says there, I now 
And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made, made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. So he says it's all about the promises, these promises which talk to us of many things, one of which is the resurrection. And he says, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you, King Agrippa, that God should raise the dead? Of course, God is able to do this. This is the hope of the faithful. This is clear Bible teaching. We read in John 5, verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. Uh, and a little bit later on in that passage, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So what we understand from this passage then is that for those who are responsible to, uh, to, to God and to the judgment, those who will be raised, death is like a sleep because they are able to hear the voice of the son of God when it comes. They are able to hear his voice and they're able to come forth. They're able to be raised, it says here. And not only that, it tells us in this passage, doesn't it, that there's a resurrection of life and there's a resurrection of damnation, which is very interesting. Well, hold that in your minds. We'll just move on to, to look at another example now. Uh, what about the Sadducees? Now, there were during Christ's teaching, there were a, a number of people that wanted to catch him. Uh, uh, one of which were the, the group of Sadducees. Now, they didn't believe that there was any resurrection. So they come to him and, uh, and ask him a question which they think is really tricky. What does Jesus say? He says, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world, i.e. the kingdom of God to come, and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels, and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. This is really interesting. It gives us another insight, doesn't it? It tells us that the, this state of being, after those resurrected are, are glorified, will be a, a state where they are equal to the angels, as it were. Uh, no more can they die. They're the children of the resurrection. And, and just to use the same uh, passage from a different gospel record, this time in Matthew, uh, it's very interesting because Jesus says to these Sadducees, you've got it wrong. Do ye not therefore err, because you know not the scriptures, neither the power of God, for when they shall rise from the dead, not only are, are you wrong uh, about there not being any resurrection, uh, let me tell you about how they're going to rise. Neither, uh, neither, uh, sorry, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but as the angels which are in heaven, and as touching the dead that they rise, the Lord Jesus Christ says, haven't you read in the book of Moses, how in the bush God spake to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You do therefore greatly err. Uh, and the point is, is that the Lord Jesus Christ is saying to them, you've got it wrong about resurrection. There is going to be a resurrection. God is not the dead, the God of the, the dead, but of the living. That is why when uh, God speaks to Moses out of the bush, he says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Now, if there was no more purpose with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, who were long dead by that point, then what would be the point of God saying that he was their God? He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. It's because God's purpose is founded in those promises that we, some of which we've seen uh, through Abraham, uh, Isaac and Jacob. Very quickly, then, let's just have a look at the raising of Lazarus. At the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, one of his uh, very close friends, Lazarus, uh, the brother of Mary and Martha, uh, was sick to death. Jesus deliberately waits to go and visit so that he, he actually would die, so that his, the power of God uh, can be revealed to those around him in his raising from the dead. Now, Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Of course, by that point, they were a number of days late. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, he will give it thee. Jesus says, thy brother shall rise again. Or well, Martha says, of course, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. It tells us, doesn't it? This is what the faithful have believed throughout the centuries. Of course, it's the resurrection. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And we know, of course, then that Lazarus was raised at that point. At that point, raised and would have died again. But the point being is that, the, that he was raised for a particular purpose at that time uh, when Jesus was on the earth. But this also displays to us that there must be a resurrection at the last day. So from both the Old and New Testament scriptures, we clearly see that there will be a resurrection. This will include the just to whom it becomes a resurrection of life uh, and the unjust uh, to whom it becomes a resurrection of damnation. Uh, and just a quote there from Luke 13, uh, just to give us an idea then that there isn't actually a fiery torment um, as we will 
you will hear on other uh, Sunday mornings from, from this platform. But actually, what is uh, the damnation, if you like? Well, the damnation is that of death, and the anguish is that of those who see that they no longer have the hope of eternal life in God's kingdom, and they must live out the rest of their mortal days again. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. God is not vindictive, my friends. He doesn't take delight in the persecution of the wicked, but he is just, and he will give to each according to their works and faith. This resurrection will be at the last day, as seen above, uh, which uh, uh, precedes a judgment uh, of the just and the unjust. Uh, and the resurrection of life, then, is clearly based on belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and following his example in a life of faithful service. So to bring our thoughts towards a conclusion, let's, let's start to think then, what about the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, he said to his disciples then, didn't he, about how he must be killed, but that he would be raised again the third day. And we know, don't we, that how after the death of Christ, after his sacrifice, that the women went very early in the morning to see Jesus and to, or, or to see the body as they thought. But when they came, there was nothing there. Uh, uh, other than the grave clothes, of course. And two men that stood by, two angels in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but risen. Of course, this was something they should have uh, understood, we think. But it was something, of course, that was remarkable and amazing. We can understand how they would have thought that way. And I mentioned earlier how we were going to see uh, about the promises to David. We have here uh, a passage from Acts 13, where we are being told about uh, David, uh, how he was both dead and buried at that point, uh, long dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us to this day. But being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Well, that's referring back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, which we saw a few moments ago. So what's it saying? It's saying that because David was a prophet, and he knew what God had said to him, and he knew that it was going to happen, that Christ would be raised up to sit on his throne. There was going to be this resurrection. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Now, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. So what we understand then is that the Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, wasn't he? And his soul was not left in hell, neither did it see corruption. And he was raised up whereof many people were witnesses. And what this passage also tells us is that through this man is preached unto, our, unto you or unto us the forgiveness of sins. Well, how is that possible? Well, let's have a look. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what does it tell us? Well, it tells us that because Christ was risen from the dead, because he was raised, because he was, as it describes, the first fruits, therefore, we can also have a sure and certain hope of resurrection. Uh, or, or at least the faithful can have a sure and certain hope of resurrection. Because it tells us there, if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. You're yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. But since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. So we see quite clearly, don't we, how that it is because of Christ's sacrifice and his resurrection. Uh, that we are able to, uh, A, B, uh, uh, you know, uh, forgiven for our sins and to be able to be uh, partakers of the, of, of the hope of Israel, um, which is through resurrection. But B, we can be assured of that fact because it's happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the first fruits because he has risen in such a way. Therefore, those that are faithful afterward at Christ's coming are also sure to be raised. We uh, don't want to spend any time on it, but we just want to say about the importance of baptism. Of course, that's talking about uh, a sim symbolic um, planting together in the likeness of his death and in the likeness of his resurrection. So that's very important and something for another day. But blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, have begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away. I'm going to skip those slides because we're, we're out of time.
Uh, but thank you so much for your attention uh, and for listening. The hope of the resurrection is clearly taught in the pages of scripture is a wonderful hope. Uh, and we, uh, we know that those who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ will not prevent them which are asleep. And so we look forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ soon. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org if you enjoyed the episode then please share it with others until next time may god bless you in your studies and your walk towards god's kingdom amen